All right, can we get started? All right, yesterday, in a little bit of time we have, I just basically gave just a short overview of, of the immune system. Obviously, a lot of the details we're going to fill in as, as we go along. And what we want to concentrate on now is, is this arm of the immune system, the innate or nonspecific arm of the immune system. And we'll talk a lot about the, the primarily to the cellular components today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the humoral components, but one of the major humoral components, is, as you're going to see, is, is complement. And there's going to be a whole, uh, the next hour, basically dealing strictly with complement. So we'll talk about the various components of this nonspecific immune system. And in this system, there are, there are a number of different barriers. First of all, there are anatomical barriers, and we'll discuss those. Those include mechanical factors, chemical factors, biological factors. Then there are, are humoral components. Complement is one of the major humoral components of the nonspecific immune system. And as I said, we'll have a, the next lecture, we'll deal exclusively with complement, so we won't talk about that much today. But in addition, there are other components, because certain components of the coagulation system are components of this system, uh, cytokines. There's a variety of cytokines that are involved in humoral components of the nonspecific immune system. But we'll spend most of our time talking about the cellular components, the neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, NK cells, and eosinophils. All right, so let's start with the anatomical barriers. We are constantly being exposed, obviously, to a lot of, of, of bacteria, and some of them are pathogens, some of them are non-pathogen. Uh, but they don't, they don't get in, they, we don't get infected with these things. We don't, and they certainly don't cause disease because we have a number of different barriers. The skin itself is a good barrier. Uh, we're covered with bacteria, but those bacteria don't penetrate through the skin. Uh, so it, it acts as a, a physical barrier. In addition, obviously, where the desquamation of, of skin, also any bacteria that, that attach to the skin will ultimately be, be sloughed off. So the skin actually is part of this nonspecific immune system acting just as an anatomical barrier. In other places, though, in the mucous membranes, in the, in the epithelial, uh, the, the non-ciliated epithelial of the, the uh, respiratory tract, and in the GI tract, the peristalsis of the GI tract keeps things moving through the, through the tract and keeps the bacteria moving as well so that we, they, don't, they don't establish and colonize our tissues. Uh, in, the, in the respiratory tract, the mucociliary elevator, acts as part of this nonspecific system. As we inhale organisms, they get trapped in the mucus. We cough that, the, the mucus comes up through the mucociliary ele elevator, and we either swallow it or, or expectorate it. Uh, the flushing action of, of tears and saliva, this acts as a, as a, as a barrier to infection because the, the bacteria are constantly being removed as, as with, with the tears, saliva, and, and the urine. So these all play part of this barrier. Um, in addition to the, these, just these anatomical features, there are, there are chemical barriers at these sites as well. So for example, in the skin, sweat, can, sweat contains a number of antimicrobial fatty acids that are very good in killing, killing bacteria. So sweat plays a role in this, in, in this system. Uh, in the mucous membranes, uh, the low pH, uh, because of the HCL in, this, in the stomach, is a very effective barrier. Most bacteria are, are going to have a, survive usually around a neutral pH. Now, there are some exceptions, of course, but, but most bacteria are killed at these low pH. So the low pH of the stomach is, is, a, is a chemical barrier. Tears and saliva, in addition to the, acting as just through their sloughing or their washing action, they also contain chemical components that, that are, are protective. So for example, they have lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that, that breaks down bacterial cell walls. When Dr. Fox comes in, in in the bacteriology section, he'll talk to you about the cell walls. And this is one of the enzymes that breaks down those cell walls. Uh, they also contain uh, phospholipases that destroy membranes. So bacteria are killed then by these, by these chemicals or these materials in the, the tears and saliva. Uh, in the G, in respiratory and GI tract, there are small proteins called defensins that are, that are antimicrobial, and they kill bacteria. And in the lung, even the, so those surfactants in the lung are protective. They act as opsonins. This is a term you may not have come across before. An opsonin is something that, that increases, or, or increases the phagocytosis of a particle by a, a phagocytic cell. So it, it enhances phagocytosis 
in phagocytic cells. So anything that, that does that is referred to as an opsin. It comes from the Greek meaning uh, prepare for eating. So it, it's like the condiment that the, the phagocytes like to, or ingesting these, these organisms. So these acts are as uh, opsins. And we'll see a number of opsins as, we're, as we go through today. <laughs> and there are biological factors as well. The normal flora, we're, as I said, we're covered with bacteria on the, on the surface. Any, any surface, any part of our body that is exposed to the environment, our GI tract, the eyes, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, oropharynx, all of these areas are, have a normal flora that's normally there. And those things, those, that normal flora actually plays a very important role. Uh, they secrete antibacterial substances that kill other bacteria. That's one way they do it. But in addition, they're competing with the pathogens for colonization of the tissue. Uh, before a pathogen can cause disease, one of the first steps in the disease process is colonizing the tissue. So if it can't colonize the tissue because the normal flora is already is competing with it, then you don't get infection and you don't get disease. Uh, there's also competition for, in addition for space, just for, for nutrients as well. There, uh, when Dr. Fox comes in, he'll tell you a number of nutritional requirements for bacteria. And the normal flora is ob obviously competing with, the, with any pathogens for uh, those nutrients. So all of these are just anatomical features that, that result in, in some protection. But in addition to that, the next group is, are the humoral components of the nonspecific immune system. And this includes this, this complement. And, and again, we'll talk a lot about complement in the next hour. But this, you're going to see the complement can lyse bacteria. There's a number of components that act as opsonins. Uh, you get increased vascular permeability, recruitment and activation of phagocytic cells. All of these are consequences of activation of this, of this complement system. Uh, and they, they obviously play an important role in protection. Uh, the coagulation system. Uh, there are components of the coagulation system. You, you remember that cascade that you studied increased, that increased vascular permeability, recruit the phagocytic cells to the site of the infection. And in addition, there are some components actually released by the, the platelets, the beta lysin, that is a very good cationic detergent and, and, and kills bacteria. Lactoferrin and transferrin. Uh, in, 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 the, in the serum and, and other secretions also plays an important role. Iron is a very important nutrient for, for bacteria, as well as for us, but iron is fairly insoluble. Certainly, for, uh, uh, iron is not very soluble in, in liquid systems, and so there's a, this competition. We need iron, so what we do is we have actoferrin and transferrin that bind up the iron and keep it soluble. That protects, that, that prevents the bacteria from getting the iron. And as you're going to see when Dr. Fox comes in, they have ways of trying to, to get the iron too. They make things that, that chelate iron as well. But our lactoferrin and transferrin actually, by, by binding up the iron, deprive the bacteria of this important nutrient. Again, lysozyme breaking down cell walls and various cytokines that have a variety of effects that we'll be hearing about as we go through. All right, and then there are the cellular components. The neutrophils, their main function is phagocytosis and intracellular killing of the bacteria, although they can lead to inflammation and some tissue damage, so there can be detrimental effects of their activities. The macrophages, again, primarily the phagocytosis and intracellular killing, and we're going to see how, that, how these two phagocytes kill bacteria shortly. Uh, macrophages have this other ability. In addition to killing the bacteria directly, Back, uh, macrophages also have what is referred to as their extracellular killing ability. And what this means, this is the ability of a macrophage to kill another cell, one of our cells, that may be, for example, virus infected or, or malignant cell. So ma macrophages can have this ability to kill other cells. Uh, and that's referred to as their extracellular killing capacity. Uh, macrophages are involved in tissue repair. And macrophages are one of these cells uh, in the nonspecific immune system that actually interact with comp components of the specific immune system. So and macrophages play an important part in presenting <coughs> antigen to the adaptive immune response so that the adaptive immune response can take hold. NK and LAC cells. NK stands for natural killer cells. Uh, LAC cells stands for act LAC lymphokine activated killer cells, and we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail, but these cells have the ability to kill virus-infected 
and or altered our malignant cells. And so they're, they're involved in protecting against virus infected and altered self targets. And the eosinophils, eosinophils primarily in the killing of, of, of certain parasites, primarily the worm parasites. They're, they're very effective in killing worm parasites. All right. So let's talk then about these the phagocytic cells first. And, and we'll talk about phagocytosis and intracellular killing. So how do the neutrophils and the PMNs, uh, the neutrophils and the macrophages, phagocytose particles and kill them? All right, for the PMNs. Obviously, you remember from your histology, the PMNs have this characteristic multi-shaped nucleus that you, you, can, you can easily see when it with, I mean, with the microscope. In addition, you, it's not very clear in here, but they have a number of different granules that we'll talk about, and the contents of these granules are important in the, in the intracellular killing process. Although these, these cells can be distinguished morphologically by the, by the shape of their nucleus when you stain, the, stain, the, uh, stain these cells, there is another way of, of identifying these things. They have on their surface a, this, an antigen called CD66, and so looking for that particular antigen is a marker for those particular cells. So it, it can be done morphologically, but it can also be done uh, by, trying to, by looking for the presence of that particular antigen on the surface. As far as the granules are concerned, there are two different types of granules in these cells. The primary granules, sometimes these are referred to as the azurophilic granules, and it's because of the way they stain. They, they stain a bluish color uh, when, you, when you stain them. Uh, and the second type of granules are the second, the second, are called the secondary granules. Sometimes you'll see them referred to as specific granules. The azurophilic or the primary granules are characteristic of the young, young neutrophils. So the young neutrophils have a lot more of these azurophilic or primary granules. And these contain a number of different uh, components that are uh, bactericidal. They have cationic proteins. They have this lysozyme that can digest bacteria. They have defenses in them. They have elastase. They also have a, what is characteristic of these granules is the presence of this enzyme myeloperoxidase. The secondary granules also contain a number of different uh, components, some of which can be antibacterial. The, the lysozyme lysozy is there. They have components of an enzyme called NADPH oxidase, and we'll see what the importance of this thing is shortly. But the, it's not the complete enzyme, but they have certain components of that, of that enzyme. What's characteristic of these granules is the presence of lactoferrin and a vitamin B12 binding protein. So those are these, the ones that are highlighted in bold are the ones that distinguish one granule from the other. All right, the other phagocytes are the, the macrophages and monocytes, the mononuclear phagocytes. And again, they have, if you remember from your histology, they have this characteristic kidney-shaped uh, nucleus. It's not always as clear as, as, as it looks in this picture to see that, that uh, kidney-shaped nucleus. Uh, but when you do see it, it it's, it's characteristic of these, these cells. Now, these cells don't have a lot of the granules, but they do contain a lot of the lysozymes, which, with lysosomes, which contain many of the same components as the granules that you find in the neutrophils. And again, while they can be distinguished morphologically by looking for this characteristic nucleus, uh, characteristically shaped nucleus, there is this membrane marker CD14 that, that's commonly used to identify these cells. Uh, so they're CD14 positive. <laughs> All right. So how do these these two groups of cells, the phagocyte, the, the phagocytic cells, the neutrophils and the and the monocyte macrophages, how do they respond to infection? And and what is what is their response? How do they know that there's an infection going on? Well, there are a number of different what I refer to as SOS signals that alert these cells that an infection is taking place. One of these is, is informal methionine-containing peptides. Now, bacteria, when bacteria make proteins, when they synthesize proteins, they start protein synthesis with, the N, uh, with an informal methionine, as, as always, is always the N-terminal uh, sugar when, when bacteria start um, protein synthesis. Now, we don't do that. We use methionine as our initiating amino acid in protein synthesis. So the, the ability to detect an informal methionine-containing peptide is a signal that a bacterial infection has occurred. So this, 
the, the phagocytes have on their surfaces receptors for informal, informal methionine-containing peptides. And, and we, the reason we say it's peptides here, although bacteria start always protein synthesis with informal methionine, very often they cleave off a part of their internal, uh, pro, terminals of the protein. So you, they release these small peptides that are contained in the informal methionine. <coughs> So this is a signal then that, that there's an infection going on, and that will attract uh, neutrophils and, and PM and uh, macrophages and alert them that an infection is going on. In addition, when there's tissue damage, obviously there's going to be some clotting, and when there's clotting, components of the clotting system are signals for the macrophages and the, and the uh, PMNs that an infection has occurred or that there's tissue damage has occurred, and they will be attracted to the site. As we're going to see, there's various components of the complement system. When complement gets activated, that act as signals that an infection has occurred and retracts the, the phagocytic cells. And then there are finally various cytokines. So any or all of these things that are released at the site of an infection then become the initial SOS or danger signal that there is something going on and it, it, it alerts the phagocytic cells. And in response to those signals, then the phagocyte responds. And one of the first thing that happens is that they begin to adhere to the endothelial cell. This, this is the lumen of, the, of a blood vessel. This is the endothelial cell lining, and here's our bacteria in the tissue. All right, so the, the first thing that happens is these, these cells begin to adhere to the uh, endothelial cells. Now, I'm not going to go into all the specifics of, of what, what, that, what is involved in that adherence. Suffice it to say that the the endothelial cells expressed on there, in response to these signals, the endothelial cells also respond, and they begin to express certain cell surface um, molecules, and those are recognized by receptors on the phagocytic cells, and the phagocytic cells, which normally are, are circulating, now begin to arrest and stick to the endothelium. <coughs> and so you get adherence to the vasculature. Then those cells, diapodes, are moved through the be in between the cells of the, end, the endothelial cells lining the, the capillaries. Uh, again, remember, many of these things increase vascular permeability, so you're loosening up the vasculature, and the, and the junctions between the endothelial cells are loosened up, and the, the phagocytic cells can then make their way and migrate through the endothelial cell layer into the tissue spaces. Once they get into the tissue spaces, these, these, these components act as, as chemoattractants. So there is a chemotaxis, and which is movement of the cell towards an increasing concentration gradient. Obviously, the concentration is going to be highest at the site of the, uh, the, the infection. And so these cells then move towards the infection by chemotaxis. In addition, many of these components, and, so in, 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 and there's others besides those that are listed here, act activate these cells. And by, by activation, activation, the term activation is simply used to, to define a state in which a cell can carry out its functions a lot better. So the macrophages are phagocytic. After they're activated, they even phagocytose even better. All right, so there's many of these components. Activate these cells, and finally, these cells then phagocytose the organism and kill it. So how does the phagocytosis work? All right. <coughs> Phagocytosis occurs by the attachment of the, uh, the infecting organism or the bacterium to the surface of the phagocytic cell. And there are a number of different ways that that attachment can occur. Phagocytic cells have on their surface receptors for immunoglobulin. They're called FC receptors. And they, so, and they, so they have these receptors on their surface. If a bacterium... If we get infected with the bacterium, and, and if we have antibodies already to that bacterium, those antibodies will bind to the bacterial cell. So this is an antibody bound to the bacterial cell, and then that will, fit, will engage with, it, with the FC receptors on the phagocytic cell, bringing the, the bacterium into contact with the phagocytic cell. But this is not the only way, because obviously that requires that we would have to have antibody present, if that were the only system we have. But this is one way that there's this interaction. But if we don't have antibodies yet, what happens if it's the first time we see it? Well, then the phagocytes have a variety of other types of receptors that will cause the attachment of the phagocyte. Complement receptors. There are 
<coughs> receptors on phagocytes for various components of complement. We'll see that in the next hour. Uh, so here's a complement receptor, and there's, there's bacterium with complement, engages the complement receptor, and phagocytosis will be initiated. Uh, in addition, their macrophages and, and PMNs have uh, scavenger receptors. Sa scavenger receptors are receptors that have a broad spectrum of, of ligands. Typically, they're polyanions. So any, any, many, different poly, many different polyanions will, will be ligands for this particular receptor. So here we have a, uh, where is it? There's, a, there's a, a scavenger receptor engaging its ligand on the bacterial cell. So again, another way just to bring the bacterium into contact with the phagocytic cell. And then finally, there are a series of recept uh, receptors called toll-like receptors. <coughs> And these, like the scavenger receptor, also recognize broad um, patterns of, of different kinds of molecules. And we'll talk a little bit more about these when we talk about the, the antigens in, in probably tomorrow. Uh, but these toll-like receptors also recognize components on bacterial cells, in allowing the bacterial cell to come into contact with the phagocytic cell. So by any one of these, any or all of these means, the, phagos, the bacteria, the phagocytic cell, can recognize and bind to the, the bacterium. And then the process of phagocytosis occurs. After the initial binding, the macrophage extends pseudopods around the, the particle and begins to engulf the particle. Eventually, the, the pseudopods fuse, the membrane fuses, and we get the formation of what is referred to as a phagosome. The, the bacteria is contained in a phagosome. And then the various granules in the case of the PMNs or the lysosomes in the case of the macrophages begin to fuse with these, these, this vesicle to produce what is referred to as a phagolysosome. And the contents of these, these granules or the contents of the lysosomes are dis, 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 discharged into the, uh, into the vesicle and the, the bacteria is killed. So how is it killed? <coughs> Immediately after attachment of, of any of, of, of the bacteria to any of the, phag the phagocytes, there is an increase, there's what is called a respiratory burst. And, and basically, it was initially de described just as an increase in oxygen consumption by phagocytic cells after or during that process of phagocytosis, it referred to as the respiratory burst. And we know now that the respiratory burst is, com is composed of a series of reactions that ultimately consume oxygen uh, and lead to the production of, of uh, highly toxic materials. So how, what are those reactions? It starts with glucose and NADP. Remember the, the hexose monophosphate shunt from, from your biochemistry? The first step is the conversion of glucose by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase into a pentose phosphate, NAD, NADPH. That NADPH becomes the substrate then for the following reactions. The NADPH is a substrate, and this enzyme NADPH oxidase, remember the, the, the PMNs in their secondary granules had the components of this NADPH oxidase. When these vesicles, and when these um, granules fuse with the phagosome, they reconstitute the functional NADPH oxidase. There are components in the vesicle uh, membranes already, and then some of the components are there, and then when the, when, the, when, the, uh, when the granules fuse with them, the, all the components of the NADPH oxidase can organize and form a functional NADP, NADPH oxidase. And what that enzyme does is it catalyzes the, the uh, oxidation of NADPH to NADP and the production of a, a toxic oxygen compound called superoxide anion. And this is, this is toxic to cells. It is, is a reactive oxygen species that will, will oxidize proteins and lipids and whatnot in the, in the bacterial cell and ultimately kill the bacterial cell. But this is not the only uh, uh, toxic product that is produced because some of that superoxide anion that's produced by this reaction and in this acidic environment can be converted by superoxide dismutase into peroxide and singlet oxygen. And the, the vesicle, the, the phagolysosome, is highly acidic. So this reaction occurs with the superoxide dismutase to produce peroxide, 
which is obviously uh, bactericidal. That's what we use to disinfect wounds. We pour peroxide over them. And also singlet oxygen, which is highly reactive oxygen species and is also toxic. Some of this superoxide that comes from this reaction can all then react with the peroxide that comes from this reaction to produce hydroxyl radical and some more singlet oxygen. So by these reactions, we get the production of a number of different toxic compounds. And they're all reactive oxygen species that are very, very reactive oxidizing proteins and lipids and so on to kill the, ultimately kill the bacteria. And of course, this is happening in that, in that vesicle. Uh, now, it turns out that, that these vesicles, these, these granules and, and lysosomes actually begin fusing with that um, phagosome even before the phagosome is completely pinched off. And so consequently, some of these reactants actually can leak out into tissue spaces, and that's one of the reasons why you get some collateral tissue damage in infections uh, when there's a response, because some of these things are actually leaking out and in, in, uh, damaging the adjacent tissue. All right, these reactions here that we just described are referred to as the oxygen-dependent myeloperoxidase independent reaction because obviously oxygen is used in this thing, but there's no myeloperoxidase involved in any of these reactions. So this will occur even in the absence of myeloperoxidase. If myeloperoxidase is also present, and obviously it's present in those, in those azurephilic or primary granules, uh, then additional toxic products can be produced. What myeloperoxidase does, myeloperoxidase catalyzes the, 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 the reaction where the hydrogen peroxide from the, from the uh, previous slide, the hydrogen, any hydrogen peroxide, and here it's indicated as chloride ion. Uh, in fact, it can be any halide. Chloride is obviously the most common halide uh, in, in, in our tissues, so chloride is predominantly used. But if this were iodide, it would work just as well, or bromide, it would also work. Uh, but the, and what myeloperoxidase does is it catalyzes the, the conversion of these to hypochlorous acid, which is also toxic. Hypochlorous, that's, that's essentially, that's bleach. Uh, that's our typical household bleach, so it's uh, highly reactive with, with, bacterial, with, with any bacteria, viruses, anything. And it'll, it'll obviously oxidize and chlorinate our proteins and destroy them. In addition, some of this uh, hypochlorous acid can be converted into some additional uh, super, uh, singlet oxygen. So by these reactions, we get some, some another toxic product, hypochlorous acid, and some additional singlet oxygen being produced. Uh, these are referred to as oxygen-dependent, myeloperoxidase-dependent uh, reactions of the respiratory burst. So as a consequence of this respiratory burst and these series of things, of the reactions, we have the production of these various highly toxic reactive oxygen species, which ultimately then kill the bacterial cell. Now, these molecules, these toxic molecules, again, are, are small molecules, so they're going to be able to diffuse out of that, out of that phagosome, phagolysosome, and actually get into the cell. So the cell has got to have a way of protecting itself against these, these things as well. Otherwise, there's going to be damage to the cell itself. Uh, and so there are some detoxifica de de detoxification reactions that go on. Uh, and they're indicated here. The, the superoxide anion in an acidic environment, as superoxide dismutase, we saw this, goes to, leads to the production of peroxide. But the peroxide, can be detoxified by catalase, resulting in the formation of just water and the release of molecular oxygen. So the cells have superoxide dismutase and catalase, and that helps to detoxify the uh, peroxide. So any superoxide that is produced as a consequence of that NADPH oxidase can be ultimately returned back to water and molecular oxygen within the cell. And so those are, act as protective mechanisms. In addition to the oxygen-dependent killing, by either whether they're dependent on myeloperoxidase or not, the oxygen-dependent killing, there's also oxygen-independent killing. Uh, many of the other components of those granules have direct mi microbial activity, so antimicrobial activity. So those cationic proteins damage the, the microbial membranes. 
The lysozyme will hydrolyze and break down the, the, end, the cell wall of the bacterium. The lactoferrin depriving of the iron. And then there are a series of hydrolytic enzyme proteases in there that digest and kill the organism. So even in situations where you don't have the respiratory burst or if the respiratory burst is compromised in some way, we have this oxygen independent killing mechanisms to protect us. And there, there are, for example, uh, uh, instances where there are deficiencies in either myeloperoxidase or the NADPH oxidase. And so patients that have deficiencies in the respiratory burst, the oxidative, the oxygen-dependent respiratory burst, <coughs> they, while those, those patients are actually more susceptible to bacterial infections, they don't die. They actually survive. And they can survive because we have this, this backup system, these, this oxygen-independent killing. So when you look at the intracellular killing, it, it basically it's broken down into the dependent, oxygen-dependent, oxygen-independent, and this is further subdivided into whether or not it's dependent upon myeloperoxidase. <laughs> All right, so, so the, the phagocytes, that, then, that's how they take in the organism then and kill the organism. Now, in the case of macrophages, macrophages have an additional way of killing uh, and this is the nitric oxide dependent killing. And what happens in, with, in, in, in macrophages is that the engagement of a macrophage with its ligand, whatever that, that happens to be, again, it could be, the, it could be scavenger receptor, it could be toll-like receptor, any of those receptors. In response to that, in addition to phagocytosin, the particle, what happens is that the, the, macroph the macrophage also releases the cytokine TNF, uh, it begins to, it, it actually, the, the gene for TNF is activated and TNF is made and secreted. And that TNF can come back and in, in bind back to the macrophage. Now, obviously, the TNF can bind to other macrophages as well, but in addition, it can, it, it can uh, act uh, uh, and bind back to the initial macrophages because that macrophage has a receptor for TNF. And that activates a gene called INOS, which is a gene for in the inducible nitric oxide synthase, and the result is the production of nitric oxide. It, so it's an enzyme that makes nitric oxide. It, it uses arginine as a substrate and, and makes nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide is also a toxic product. It is also a reactive oxygen species. <laughs> now, if these macrophages have also encounter interferon gamma, then there's even the, an enhanced production of nitric oxide. Now, interferon gamma is that we haven't, we haven't talked about it, but you're going to see as we get into the, the adaptive immunity, that's a product of the adaptive immune response. So this is, again, one of those ways that these two systems interact. So products of the adaptive immune response can enhance the, and the uh, in killing ability of macrophages in, by enhancing the ability of the macrophage to make nat nitric oxide. So this nitric oxide then can kill the cells. In addition, nitric oxide is, is able to kill other cells, so the, if this is a virus-infected cell in the vicinity, and this is one of the mechanisms by which mac macrophages kill uh, virus-infected cells, is by the secretion or production of nitric oxide. <laughs> All right, so in addition to the phagocytes, there are a number of other cells that have the ability, that, in the, that are components of the nonspecific immune system that have the ability to kill other cells. And these, these, all of these cells here, the NK and LAC cells, the K cell, activated macrophage, eosinophils, all of these cells kill virus-infected or altered self cells, modified or altered self targets. So they have the targets the, either a virus-infected cell or a cell that is our own cell that is modified in some way. All right, and so we want to look at each of these cells and, and uh, see what they do. All right, and natural killer cells, NK cells. These cells, uh, that's NK cells that stands for natural killer cells. So the, these cells have this ability to kill the virus-infected or the uh, altered self cells. These cells are also referred to as large granular lymphocytes. If you look at them morphologically stained, they look like a lymphocyte in that they're mononuclear cells, but they're a little, they're larger than lymphocytes, and they have a lot more cytoplasm. If you remember back from your histology, the lymphocyte 
and it has very small amount of cytoplasm, all right? But these cells have a lot of uh, cytoplasm, or a lot more cytoplasm, and they also have granules in them. There's not, not a lot of granules, but there are some granules in them. And so they, these cells are also referred to as LGLs, or large granular lymphocytes. And as I said, these kill virus-infected and malignant cells. Again, you can distinguish them morphologically, but it's really, it's really kind of difficult because you don't find a lot, for example, if you look in, in peripheral blood, you don't find a lot of these cells in peripheral blood, and so they're, they're pretty difficult to identify morphologically. So again, there are some markers that are helpful in identifying these cells. There are CD56 and CD16. So these cells express CD56 and CD16, and they lack... CD3. CD3, as you're going to see, is a marker for T cells. Uh, so uh, their cells, and the true NK cell is a CD56, CD16 positive, CD3 negative cell. Okay. And these cells, when they are activated by cytokines, either interleukin-2 or interferon gamma, activation of these cells by these cytokines uh, results in the conversion of these NK cells into the LAC cells. And LAC cell simply stands for lymphokine activated killer. So this is just an activated NK cell. But they do, after activation, have some different activities that we'll talk about. <coughs> so how do you get these lymphokine activated cellers, killer cells and what do they do? Again, exposure to either interferon or interleukin-2 will convert the NK cell into a, an activated cell, which will now be able to kill malignant cells. Continued exposure to these, these, these uh, cytokines will, convert, will activate the cell even further so that not only will it kill a, a malignant cell, it will now kill just a transformed cell. So these LAC cells then are nothing else but NK cells that have been activated by lymphokines. And there's a lot of interest in these cells, and there's actually, these cells are being used in the treatment of, 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 of people with tumors. What, what, what is being done is to take out the NK cells from, from the individual that has a tumor and activate the cells in vitro with lymphokines, usually IL, IL-2, and then inject those cells, those activated cells, back into the patient. Those cells will home them in and kill the tumor cells, all right, because they have that ability. So LAC, LAC cell therapy is actually a therapy that is, is employed in a number of different cases. <coughs> now, if you think about NK cells in, in, in these LAC cells, they're killing our cells, self cells. So how is it that the NK cell can kill the, the virus infected the malignant cell, but not damage an uninfected cell? All right. It turns out that these, these cells, the ligand that these cells are recognizing, and do, which brings them into contact with the target cells so that they can kill, the ligand is actually present on all of our cells. So why aren't they killing all of our cells? But the reason they're not killing all of our cells is that there are actually two types of receptors that are engaged. The K-A-R uh, is the killer act, uh, activating receptor, and the K-A-L is the killer activating ligand. So this ligand here is present on all our cells. That's what the NK cell and the, the LAC cell are recognizing to, to home in on the target to kill that target. All right? The reason that they don't kill our normal cells is that, in addition, these cells, the NK cells and uh, LAC cells, have another receptor called the KIR, which is the killer inhibitory receptor. So they have an activating receptor and an inhibitory receptor on the NK cell. All right. This killing, killer inactivating receptor recognizes a component on the cells, which is here just is referred to as MHC class 1. Uh, when Dr. McCallop comes in, he's going to tell you all about the structure of, of MHC class 1. These are components of the major histocompatibility complex, a particular molecule that's produced. And this is the receptor, or this is the ligand for this KIR. So what happens in a normal situation, when an uninfected or a normal type cell, the NK cell or the LAC cell recognizes the killing activating ligand, 
All right, so it's, it's going to be killed. But in addition, the killer inhibitory receptor engages the MHC class 1 and killing is inhibited. So this will not, there will be no killing in this case. Now what happens during the process of transformation or in, and during the process of, after virus infection, what happens is that the cells after infection or, or while they're in the process of transforming into a malignant cell, they actually downregulate one of the things that happens is that they downregulate class 1 MHC. Either it's completely gone or at least it's, it's, it's lower in quantity. As a consequence of that is that when the NK cell encounters this cell, the activating receptor is engaged, but the inhibitory receptor is not because the MHC class 1 has been downregulated and we can kill this cell. But we, our normal cells are spared. All right, and finally, the K cells. These are the, the, the other killer cells. The K cells simply just stands for killer cell. Now, these cells, these are not a unique morphologically defined cell. In fact, there are a number of different cells that can have killer cell activity. Killer cell, uh, so that there's not a morphological definition. K killer cell is any cell that is able to mediate a process called ADCC. And what ADCC stands for is antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So any cell that can mediate, can mediate this process of antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity is classified as a killer cell. All right. What these cells, all these cells have in common is the presence of an FC receptor, a receptor for immunoglobulin. So here we have a K cell. It has a receptor for immunoglobulin. Any target cell whether that be a virus-infected cell or an altered self cell, any target cell that has antibody bound to it. So if, we have a, if you have an adaptive immune response, so you have antibody directed to this cell. The antibody, of course, will bind to the cell. And the antibody acts as the bridge that brings the killer cell in close enough contact to the target cell to kill it. So that's why it's called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So this then acts as the bridge to bring them together, and the killer cell then kills the target cell. And any cell that has an FC receptor then, and is, has the ability to kill other cells, can then be a K cell. So they will include things like NK cells. NK cells also have K cell activity. So not only can they kill naturally, as we just described, they also have this ability to carry out ADCC. Macrophages have receptors for, uh, uh, FC receptors for immunoglobulin. So there, they can act as K cells. Eosinophils have receptors for immunoglobulin. They're, they have a receptor for a different class of immunoglobulin, an IgE, but they can kill, they can act as killer cells as well. So any cell that has an FC receptor, any killer cell that has a receptor for uh, any, any immunoglobulin can act as a K cell then. So, these are the, the a group of cells then that also participate in the nonspecific immune system. Obviously, this is again one of these examples where there's interplay between the system because this only works if there's antibody present first, and obviously antibody is a product of the specific immune system. So the, this is an interplay between those two systems. All right, any questions on nonspecific immunity, either the cells or the killing? <coughs> 